The topic tonight is, are you ready for true intimacy? Take a gentle step through the doorway to closeness and vulnerability. A lot of this information comes from transmissions by the late Eva Paracos. Two of the ones I focused on are number 107, three aspects that prevent man from loving, and number 138, the human predicament of desire for and fear of closeness. True intimacy emanates only from authentic presence. Each soul possesses within a well of wisdom, love, warm feelings, guidance, understanding, and affection for others. During the meditation tonight, I'm going to suggest that you calmly observe your reactions to others. An inner tension and closed energy, a constant noise that covers your inner well and Eva calls it the treasure of love within. And these are energies that lie dormant as long as they're covered. And so I think her message tonight will help all of us to begin to dissolve those walls that block access to this inner treasure or well of love. Besides the obvious, we all have a fear of being hurt we've all been disappointed and we may get hurt and disappointed again in the future but she talks in this one lecture about three specific patterns that we have that prevent love and true intimacy from lasting the first one is fear of entrapment now I'm telling you it's not about fear of entrapment of getting into a relationship it's not necessarily about that because I work with couples that have been married 20 years and they're still one or both of them are concerned about being trapped. In other words, they made a lifelong commitment. There may be three or four birdies in the nest, but they always have one foot out the door. I'm just looking for an excuse for you to do the wrong thing so I can justify leaving. And I see this all the time. So some, and I know some of you aren't in a relationship, haven't been in one for a long time, and you could have a fear of entrapment too. It might not be conscious. To surrender to deep closeness with others will mean being forced to do things you don't want to do, making sacrifices, inconveniences, and demands that will prevent your happiness. This, of course, is the ego's illusion because the only real freedom comes from commitment, whether it's to a career or a relationship or even your own spiritual evolution. If you're not committed, then you're not free to enjoy it. So this fear of entrapment is a distortion that we bring with us from our childhood or perhaps we brought it in with us. Therefore, your deliberate reaction is to cut off the love current, in other words, to block us from feeling entrapped, which stops vulnerability. This is a very manipulative and destructive choice with the gravest of repercussions because deep-seated guilt is a consequence of this and a lack of self-confidence, self-respect, and these things always cause our self-esteem to go down. And then, of course, we want to compensate because we feel guilty. We don't exercise our own rights when we feel guilty. Guilt makes us feel unworthy, so we try to compensate for it. So instead of really loving, we try too hard, and we end up giving too much, and we end up being taken advantage of. All the person really wants is us to be <coughs> present and vulnerable and to give from an authentic place. But when we have this conscious or unconscious fear of entrapment, we feel guilty. We cut off the love flow. And it frustrates the hell out of the other person. You know what I mean? I'm sure we've all been on both sides of this. You don't know how to reach the person. So many times, we start demanding more love. And then they feel more trapped. So they cut off the love energy even more and feel more guilty. And they try to compensate for it in other ways. And we do this with kids too. I know in California that's the way because the, a lot of people are in the, like when I live in Los Angeles, a lot of people work in the entertainment business and they work 18 hours a day and they make a lot of money but they have no time for the kids so how do you think they compensate for the guilt? Yeah. What's an eight-year-old need a thousand dollars for kind of thing? Do you know? I mean it's ridiculous. I mean giving an exaggerated example, but this is what people do. That we try we compensate with our kids and we compensate with our life partner. 
by giving too much because we're not really loving them. Does that make sense? So she's suggesting as a possible solution, keep the love current open by dissolving barriers to your inner treasure of love. And so how do you dissolve the barriers? Well, that's what core energetics is all about. That's what our whole process work is to dissolve little by little over a period of time the defense system that says no to love. I won't let you in. I'll hang out with you. I'll be your friend. I'll go to the movies with you. I'll even cook you dinner. I'll have sex with you, but I'm not letting you in. Stay that far away. So we think that it's sort of being in a relationship. And unless that love current, the life energy flows between the couple with hearts open, it's not really a loving relationship. And some people, a lot of people, will, if they hang out and they feel fairly comfortable and, or maybe there's a physical attraction, they'll go ahead and then get married or something, you know? Or they'll move in together. And it never really works unless there's a, there's a real foundation of life energy being exchanged from the heart between the couple. Now, this is probably the most important part of this. It's healthy to assert your rights, your deepest wishes, and put up good boundaries with another in a relationship if you keep your heart open. In other words, people don't feel rejected. If you have a strong sense of no, if you keep your heart open when you say no. This doesn't work for me. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to go on this particular spiritual journey with you. But I still love you. I support you if you want to do it. But don't try to drag me into something that's not my truth. I will do this with you, but I won't do this. But it, see, when we do it with aggression, when we say no with aggression, we say no, we cut off the life energy and we get nasty about it, then the person feels devastated. And the intimacy goes out the window for a long time. And it's so easy to cut off that life energy, isn't it? It's so easy to get frustrated and tired and feel that we're right. And so when we come from that place, I assert my rights to not do this. It doesn't mean I'm right. It's just not my truth to do it. It doesn't mean you're wrong. I still love you. I still want to make love to you tonight. Uh, I ain't doing that. This is a really important part of relationships, and we have to, just in the meditation tonight, see if we can, see if you can let that into a deep place inside yourself. That I want to hold a space of my truth and hold the charge of love with the person. You cannot really hurt another because you say no to something outwardly, provided inwardly they feel your love for them. Okay, the second one is, the second block that Eva's talking about in this lecture is remaining above it all. And so we're all really good at that. <laughs> Almost everyone, now this is inside the ego, okay, we're talking about. Almost everyone has a secret superior world where they symbolically remain better than others. So even though you're in the midst of a big fight with your lover, there's a place where you know that they're really lost inside. And somehow, when the argument ends, they'll see the light and they'll see that they're wrong and that you're right. The ego says that. We don't say that to the other person because we might get our head bit off. We, the secret superior place, uh, we keep silent about because it's so pretentious that if we told people, they would think that we were, we were smug and arrogant and superior and all that stuff. But yet, what Eva's saying is that there is a secret place where most of us have this. Unless we've done a, done a lot of work to specifically expose it, most of us have it. You then cut off the natural warm feelings toward others who don't meet your superior standard. In other words, when we're in that egotistical place, when we're in our head, we judge other people. This person, I'm better than this person, and I'm, I might not be as good as this other person. And of course, it's not a very godly thing to do, but it's a thing that we do when we cut our heart off. We go to that judgmental place. The spiritually immature side of your personality produces unconscious guilt, doubt, 
and low self-esteem because there's a place where we know God's truth, that every single soul possesses value and dignity. And so from that place, we're not superior. There's no such thing as a superior secret world. It's an illusion. It's not something that comes out of pure consciousness and the life energy that moves between people. Okay, so what's the solution? It takes much more humility and courage to be your true, authentic, loving self to all people. Selective loving kills your spirit and the ability to be intimate with your partner. Okay, so um, the first two are, one is fear of entrapment, and the second one is remaining above it all. The third one is a desperate demand for love and intimacy. Now, a lot of people will go back and forth, as I talked about during the grounding exercises, they'll, go, they'll fluctuate between one and three. In a certain instance in a relationship, they'll fear entrapment. And then if that person begins to back off, then the other wound will kick in, and they'll feel they'll start demanding love and intimacy to please don't leave. I want you to stay. I really love you. When you force love and intimacy on another in a compulsive manner, it destroys that connection with that person. In other words, something may have the potential to be really beautiful. But if you kick into that place where you feel desperate and that you can't live without that person, then what it does is that compulsivity, that intensity, kills the spirit between you and the other. Your love is not genuine because you are blinded by your terror of rejection. So there's a deep feeling of abandonment. And then all of a sudden, at a certain point in the relationship, you realize, God, I really love this person. I want to spend my life with her. And then that feeling of abandonment kicks in. And you start a forcing current with the person. Do you know what I mean? You start feeling desperate. And the person feels that. And, and maybe in the early stages of the relationship, what do they start doing then? They start feeling frightened. They start feeling uh, a bit threatened by what they perceive as, as an aggressive, aggressive demand for love, you see? And so they instinctively pull back to a safer place. And of course, that makes you go even crazier. You know what I mean? It kicks the wound in even more that, that I'm going to be abandoned. Uh-oh, she's backing off now. You see, here it goes again. So what happens, of course, is our deepest fear always, always, always then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and this is a very common thing. And I've had to work through this myself. Um, when your love is not genuine, you are blinded by your terror of rejection. You frighten away your intended lover because your urgency allows no room to feel or appreciate the other's reality and, and to accept a deep understanding of their needs. If you're desperate for the other person's love, you don't really care about the person. You just care about yourself. And consequence, consequently, it's not real love, is it? I'm going to the other side. We, people who do this intensely, they'll, get, they'll set themselves up for rejection again and again and again. Repeated rejections reopen your original core wound, your childish inability to endure frustration. It feels like a death. Each time the person falls in love, demands the love, gets rejected by the person, it feels like a death for them. And their defense system, what? Becomes more and more intensified. If you're forcing current for love is return. So sometimes we, we run into people who are just as desperate as we are. So even though we're demanding and forcing in this way, some people will say, oh, oh that's okay. That means you really love me if you're so desperate. <laughs> I'm willing to hang out with you for a while. And they come forward. Guess what happens to your love for them? It wears off very quickly. You couldn't live without the person, now you got them, and all of a sudden, you don't, you don't want them anymore. I, you're, you're, you're not fulfilling all my needs the way I thought you would when I first met you. Now, six months later, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, but there's another woman down the street who's going to fill that big gap in my soul. And I'm very sorry, but I'm moving on now.
See it later. <laughs> you put the fading cream on, and you, you, you fade her out of your life, and then you go for the real love. <laughs> that one down the street, she's got it, what I really want. Okay. What's the solution? Well, I'll tell you what the solution is. Except that what you thought was real love ain't real love. You're starved and you feel desperate because part of you that's still this big, maybe seven months old, feels desperately abandoned. There was some, probably, some interruption in the stage of symbiosis with the bonding with mother that got broken. And the deep, at least perception in your eyes that you were abandoned. And we recreate this until we get to the core of it and we heal the frustration and the resentment. There's an energy that we hold on to in consciousness that represents the frustration and the resentment we have toward either mom or dad who abandoned us from in that place, in that very vulnerable, pre-verbal, helpless place. And the energy's got to get healed. Otherwise, the nervous system runs that energy all the time in every relationship with an anticipation of what? I love this person. Whoever I really love is going to do what? Is going to abandon me. And it, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. But I know for sure, I know for certain that it can be healed and you can come back to a calmer place. What's the solution? First, accept what you thought was real love is not. Second, Real love and true intimacy is much, much less urgent. If you're not desperately head over heels in love with the person in that place where you can't live without them, don't rule out love. It might be the real thing. It might be calmer. It might be slower moving. It might be gentler. But it might be the mature love your heart's been seeking. You might not feel desperate when you're without them. You might just feel good about them. Do you understand the difference? We're still running that forcing desperate current. We're living in the energy of the child. And if the wound doesn't get healed, the sad thing is it won't go away. So I've worked with people in their 50s and 60s who are desperate, but they can't live without this other person. Unless this person returns the love, I'd rather be dead. It's not real love. And no intimacy can come out of it. There's no equality. Face your lack of self-love and disconnection from God at its deepest level. It's a, tr it's a real disconnect. That's why I wanted to work with you and energetically. I work different with you tonight because I wanted you to see the difference between when you charge your energy, charge the, the, the life energy, and you discharge it. So you can charge up the negative in yourself as long as you discharge it. It's okay to bring a lot of negative energy, mobilize it, and exaggerate it, and fill your, fill your life force with the desperate negative part, for example, in this case, as long as you then discharge the energy. Because then you're moving through uh, the issue, you see? You're bringing it, you're, you're kind of like bringing it to a crisis. You bring it to a head, and then it kind of bursts. The wound bursts, and then you deal with it in a healthy way, and you can move through it. You know, we don't have to keep repeating these things over and over again and get, continue to get hurt like that. It's not necessary. There's got to be a place in truth, where we can heal and the Holy Spirit is present with us and it guides us to that right place where we can heal it. Does this make sense? Okay, this, this thing came to me on the airplane uh, yesterday and on the way back from Queensland. I think that a lot of these wounds around intimacy, and do you relate to these things that I've been talking about? It's true for all of us, isn't it? I mean, we, there's no escape. So it's like, I think there's a place in consciousness where we brought this stuff in with us. I mean, our parents weren't that bad, were they? 
I mean, they sort of did the best they could. And I, I think that, that we've been probably doing this for more than this life. It's just a feeling that I have. So this is what came to me. Why do almost all men and women desire true intimacy, passion, and love with every fiber of their being, and yet simultaneously are terrified of it and find many ways to sabotage it or even avoid it, what they want the most? Avoid it. And this is, this is what I got. The inability of most men and women for many centuries to be truly intimate, present, available, vulnerable, equal, romantic, and passionate is caused by an underlying lack of self-trust, lack of worthiness, and a lack of faith in God, or whatever the, great, the higher power is to you. To give our flaming light, love, and inner beauty to another and to the world is our greatest gift. To accomplish this, we must also face our darkness to purify our souls of its destructiveness. And what do I mean by its destructiveness? I don't mean that you're going to go, um, you know, bomb the government building. Uh, that, I don't think any, any, I, don't, I don't mean anything quite that dramatic. When I say uh, destructiveness, I mean the negative intention, the thing that we unconsciously do and say to consistently push the person that we love the most away from us. When we consistently do it, we force the other person to put a veneer up to the real self. And we're not even conscious of it. We say little criticisms, subtle little put-downs, we're not even aware of it. Next thing you know, we've said it. And what does the other person do? You can, when you look into your eyes, you can see. What do they do? They just they pull back. And then you, then you say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But it's too late then, isn't it? You've already said it. So what, so, uh, what I'm saying here is, what is the energy, what is that energy underneath that wants to destroy this beautiful little thing that God gave you, this little relationship that wants to grow. It doesn't, I don't care if you've been with the person 10 years. You can always start brand new tomorrow. But that, think of it this way. If you want to rekindle a relationship, see the other person as five years old. See, them, see their fragility in their heart as a little child and talk to them that I don't mean in a condescending way talk to them that way because if if the inner child inside of them is closed like a fist to you how much intimacy will come into that relationship no talk to the person John Paracco says this all the time talk don't give her that analytical spiritual bullshit he says it with a Greek accent see her as five years old see her as seven and go love her from that gentle place and see how quickly her heart opens again. From that equal, vulnerable place. You have to be in that place too, right? Otherwise you set up a, a, a father-child, a uh, mother-son or father-daughter relationship, right? Does this make sense to you? So, otherwise, if we don't, if we're not going to look at that energy that destroys the intimacy, little comments, cutting comments, pushing, 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 Eventually, if the inner child of your partner closes down to you, forget it. It's over. I mean, you could, it could take years to get it back of hard work. If the person closes their heart because they no longer trust you. They may still love you, but they don't trust you that when their, their needs are going to be honored by you. And that's what, that's what all this is about. Okay, so what I got is it's a big picture solution, but I honestly, from my heart, I believe this is the, the solution. Surrender your life to God and ask the Spirit of God to run your life, to think through you, feel through you, listen through you, and speak through you. And humbly ask the Spirit of God to expose and transform your darkness into the light. Because if, it, if, you, if you have the humility to expose it, it's powerless. I see it with anyone's demon. And once they, it doesn't matter what you've done, if you expose it, it loses all its oomph. 
that can't then go back into hiding and act out in a twisted way. And how many times do you want to expose it? Till it's gone. Again and again and again. And then, you know something? You'll run a life energy that is innocent like a child, that's pure, it has God's love in it. You make contact with that other person and they feel, wow, I really feel good about being close to this person. I really feel honored by this person. Does this make sense? It, it, it's, uh, if, you don't, if we don't have that underlying faith to hold us up and support us, then usually, eventually, the, th the relationship crashes. That's my experience for myself and you know, worth working with people for a long time. So here's what Eva says the next step should be from this, out of this place. When you look at the problem closely, it can be reduced to your fear to give of yourself and of cultivating a negative, destructive, or at least denying attitude toward life. You cannot cope with certain life situations because you withhold yourself and because you believe in me versus the other. That's what I said earlier. If you think it's, you're in a, in a fight, in a battle, and if that battle is who's going to win between you and your partner, who's going to be right, the minute you go to that energy, it's, oh, intimacy is over. It's out the window. So this is what I believe she's saying by that. Through a series of negative chain reactions, you actually are being damaged by your partner. So it appears as though me versus the other was your correct assumption, the assumption that your ego made, that this is war between men and women, or, you know, same-sex relationship. Look deep inside yourself at your attitude to life. You will see the cause of all your problems as inside yourself. I must have heard John Paracco say that a hundred times. Take the cause of every problem, put it inside yourself, and you have your power back. And you own your part, and then you can dissolve the blocks to loving. Otherwise, you're, we're going to withhold forever, aren't we? And then when we get miserable enough, we end up leaving. We both agree to disagree and bust the whole family up. And it's devastating to, to lots of people, isn't it? And then three years later, we do the same thing with a new partner. Exact same thing. Isn't that, isn't that what happens? Because we don't resolve the initial problem with our partner. We don't see our part. And it just repeats itself. You can shift your fear of true intimacy from me versus the other to me and the other. This is, it's us. It's you and me against the world. We created this block between our love and you and I together can dissolve it. Where at least each of us are 50% responsible for what's going down. And we don't get to lecture each other. It never works lecturing our partner or trying to be therapist to our partner. It simply makes the thing worse. It's easy to go there, and you know, because you, you read a few books. <laughs> it's easy to go there. Now you can begin to give the best you are to life. So here's a beautiful intention that Eva uh, channeled as well. Why don't we say this together? If you have one of the handouts, let's say it. See the intention at the end? You ready? Whatever I already am, I want to devote to life. I want deliberately for life to make use of the best I, am, I have and am. I may not be sure at this moment in what way this could happen. Even when I have ideas, I will allow for my God self of greater intelligence and wisdom deep within me to guide me. So, I just want to say to you, this particular handout, it's very condensed. I condensed this little one-page, two-sided handout from 35 pages of intense information. And it was already condensed, you understand, when I condensed it. So, I think it's worth studying. Take it home, read it again, read it again, read it with your partner, go over it. 
Talk, if you're not in a relationship, talk to your flatmate about it. And find out what it is that you can do. If you truly want a relationship that you're in to work, or your, your life partner that's coming your way at the speed of light, if you want this relationship to be really fulfilling and to go somewhere, then we have to deal with the things on this sheet. And it's important that we first get it intellectually and then bring it into the body. Because if, if we don't bring it into the life energy, then it's just more information. You could just go read it out of a, some relationships book. But this were, this, these transmissions were intended to be utilized with movement. With moving the life energy, with breath and movement and mobilization of the energy field to break down the blocks to loving. And I want to have a, a meditation on this. Would you like to have meditation? Okay. Just before you put the lights out, I just had a...